Okay, so we're back. Now, as we talked about last week a little bit, music moves in what we call octaves, and those octaves are made up of 12 notes. And we talked about it, the idea of A, then A sharp, B, and there's no black key between B and C, so B, C, C sharp, D, D sharp, E, F, again, no key between the E and the F, F sharp, G, G sharp, and A. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve notes, and then the octave. There are twelve notes in the Western world. We call that the chromatic scale. That's a good test question. True or false? There are twelve notes in the Western musical scale. True. Those twelve notes are A, A sharp, B, C, C sharp, D, D sharp, E, F, F sharp, G, G sharp, A. Well, Mr. Smith, I don't see any flats up there. Okay, well, let me write it this way. Let's write it down. Let's start up here at the A, and then go A flat. then G, then G flat, then F, then E, then E flat, then D, then D flat, then C, then B, then B flat, then A. What you need to understand is, is that these two groups of notes starting at A and moving one octave up to A, or starting at A and moving down to an A, sound exactly the same, but they're spelled differently. The black keys on the piano, or what we would call the, the chromatic notes in the scale, are half step, half step difference. In other words, if you play a C and you go up a half step, you're going to go to C sharp. But if you play a C and you go down a half step, you go to B. Now, Mr. Smith, why isn't it C flat? Well, it is. But there's no black key on a piano, so that key next to a C down is actually a B. You could call it a C flat. If I talk any more about it like this in technical terms, I confuse everybody. So when you go down from C, you go to B. When you go down from F, you go to E, because there's no black keys. Notice that these five notes are above the scale, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, A. Well, if you go a half step above that, here, between B and C, and between E and F, there is no black key. There is no black key. Now, for those of you that are musicians, you might say, man, that's confusing. Who came up with this? Ah, that's a good question. It's just the way that the monks, it's the way that the Western world, 1,400, 1,500, 1,600 years ago, 1,200 years ago, it's the way we did our music. When you go to your first week's listening folder and listen to the night music, you listen to the going and chanting, you hear that type of music, it's all based on these basic intervals of a half step and then what we call a whole step. Now, look at this. A minor interval, minor second, is a half step. If we talk about a major second, what that is is simply a half step, A to A sharp, plus another half step, A sharp to B. That's a whole step. That's a major second. Minor second's a half step. A major second is a whole step, and we get that by adding one half step plus one half step. 
You don't need to know anything else about intervals because it's way too confusing for non-musicians. Even musicians themselves get this mixed up. What I want you to, to understand is, is that these intervals are, can be, are used when you construct music both in a melodic sense and they're used in a sense of harmonic sense when you stack notes. All right. So let's listen to some of this music now. Let me, let me play some of these intervals and we can hear what I meant when I talked about happy sounds or um, what, what we would call uh, sinister sounds. So see what you think of this. See if, see if this sounds like, because this is a great use of the minor second, right in the beginning. So and it's pretty, pretty famous. This interval at the beginning of the piece is a minor second. Those two notes, that's the minor second. Moving from a G to an A flat, or a G, G, technically G to G sharp, or a G to A flat. It's the same thing, it's a distance. Start on the G pitch, and you move up one half step. That's what it sounds like. Let me play it again. Interesting, and, and I was actually at the premiere of that film, and um, took my took my fiance at the time, my my wife with me, scared to death, about squeezed my arm off. She heard that music come in, and, and she knew that something bad's going to happen when you're hearing that minor second interval, that half step. Dun, 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 dun. That evokes an emotional response. It's not like something as good is going to happen. And the other thing that's interesting about that, and you, this relates to, to the rhythm. It's a very menacing rhythm. Notice that what was happening there. Well, it was just boom, 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 boom. It was driving. And that's your duple rhythm. When you look in, uh, let's go to, in your textbook, they talk about on page 14, metrical patterns, 
You know, the, the idea that, the, the, to quote the book, the most basic pattern known as duple meter, D-U-P-L-E, alternates a strong downbeat with a weak beat. And I call it, you know, it's the Chinese torture kind of rhythm. It's incessant. It comes on. It doesn't, it's relentless. It doesn't stop. And that goes hand in hand with the minor second or the half step interval. It's just coming on. It's coming on. And if you've never seen the film, that's the beginning of the movie Jaws. And if you haven't seen that film, it's worth seeing the first five minutes just to see how John Williams, the composer, matches that scary music with what's going on in the film. Because, and, and I won't give it away for you, those of you that haven't seen it. I, I would, I'd be willing to bet that a lot of you haven't seen that. Well, it's one of the more terrifying scenes in, in movie history. It's very well done. Steven Spielberg was the director, and he was a very young man. And um, the whole story of how the film Jaws was made is you know, a, a story worth telling in itself. But the idea being is that there is a 25-foot great white shark that is in the Martha's Vineyard area. It's summertime. And this young lady is out on a date with a young man, and she wants to go swimming. And so she entices the guy, but the guy, is, he's, he's been having a couple of cocktails, and so he's kind of slow getting undressed. And meanwhile, the girl is, whoom, she's out in the water, and the music starts. And there's people in the music theater saying, don't go in the water, don't go in the water, oh my god, don't get out, get out of the water, get out of the water, right? Yeah, no, she's in the water, and you know what's going to happen, but you're thinking about it, and this music is coming on, and what does it start out? It starts out with two notes, it starts out slow, very menacing, and then what does it do? It builds up, it builds up, it builds up, and that's another one of the aspects of what we're talking about in our textbook. In the next four or five chapters, we'll start talking about dynamics. Dynamics being how loud, how soft. Where does the music go? In this case, it starts off slowly. It starts off with two notes. It starts off quiet. And then it builds. And then it builds. And then it builds. And it gets faster. And then the rhythm goes from One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. And then you bring in the secondary melody. And you start layering. You have this, you have this incessant one, two, one, two. And then you start to build on top of it with a melody line. And then you make the melody line, you add another one. And you add other instruments. And you make it bigger. And you make it bigger. We talked last week about the idea of foundation in music. And again, going back to Gregorian chant, remembering that the music was used in religious services. And the idea was to bring the service closer to the congregation so that the congregation would be closer to God. Well, popular music, the idea is being the composer wants people to enjoy his music. The, the concert promoter wants to bring people in to his establishment to hear an ensemble. A city orchestra wants to create a, a aura of community that has culture. In other words, American cities, you know, the, 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 the New York Philharmonic, you know, is close to 150, 175 years old. Um, it's an icon. The Philadelphia Orchestra, iconic. Boston Symphony, iconic. Chicago Symphony. Uh, the the um, uh, Wiener Philharmonic in Vienna. These are, these are ensembles with incredible rich histories. Well, you have secular music and you have religious music. 
Um, you have music that's used in war. Um, when you go back thousands and thousands of years, you have to understand that that you know we're, we're talking straight from the Bible now. That when uh, Joshua was outside the walls of Jericho, he didn't just attack the city straight away. He marched around the city for seven days. And what did he do? We, <laughs> he had horns and drums just to let them know we're coming. It scared the people to death. And eventually the walls collapsed. <laughs> and you know, the city was easily taken. Why? Because they were just freaked out. And Joshua used music to let them know. Genghis Khan in China, very famous, used gongs and cymbals. Let them know, I'm coming. We're coming after you. Nothing you can do. You can't stop us. Here we are. Boom, 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 boom. He'd be hitting cymbals and gongs. And their enemies would be defeated. Now, that's not to say it's always been done this way, but for many, many years. We need to remember that music is used for medical purposes. It still is in many parts of the world. And the, the, the thing that's most interesting about that is that Western cultures look at the healing powers of music in the 20th century as kind of a foolish thing. The idea of a shaman, a percussionist who can heal people. You know, in America or in Western Europe, they think, well, that's silly. Oh, really? Well, as a graduate of the University of Miami, when I was at Miami in the 70s, Miami was the only major university in America that had a music therapy program. Only one. First in the nation. Now we're everywhere. Because science in the Western world has started to catch up with the idea that music can heal. That sounds, certain sounds, can be very soothing. Those sounds are mostly made up of major tones. The idea of the major intervals. The idea of happiness, bum, 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 And I'll, I'll play some examples of that for you here in a second, if you're listening for it. But it can also, as we now know from listening to the Jaws main theme, it can scare the heck out of us. <laughs> it can make us very apprehensive. It can get us worried. There's mysteriousness. And so that brings us to this whole idea of major and minor. Now, there's mathematical reasons that a major chord and a minor chord, or a major scale and a minor scale, sound that way. It would be too confusing and would not add to your musical enjoyment if I were to spend two or three weeks going into the actual construction of major music and minor music. For this class, what I want you to think of is major is happy. Minor, scary, mysterious. There's other ways of, you know, calling this and talking about it. Let's see what the textbook says. Um, I'm looking at the third, third and fourth chapter here. Page 21. The major scale is the most familiar sequence of pitches. You can produce a C major scale, which is Do, Re, Mi, Fa, Sol, La, Ti, Do, by only playing the white keys on the piano. But if you sing the minor scale, then all of a sudden you have, a, you have different 
construction in the distance between the notes, now we're bringing, bringing in the, the black keys. Why is that? Well, page 22. The minor scale sounds quite different from the major. One reason is, is that it has a lowered or flatted third degree. Therefore, on the C minor scale, there is an E flat rather than an E natural. And what that does is that when we change from C, e, uh, C, D, E to C, D, E flat, now we've gone from happy to scary to mysterious. So let me, uh, let me queue up a few examples for you guys to hear. 